So, um, thank everybody for coming to this month's ASIG meeting. Uh, for the, those who may be listening on the recording, this is the Astronomy Tucson Astronomy Association's uh, Astronomy Fundamentals Group. Uh, we and this is a uh, regular monthly meeting. Uh, tonight we have two presentations up on on the road. One. Uh, our starting presentation will be by Pete Hermes, who will be doing a light presentation on the ancient Greek astronomer Ptolemy. Following up with that, uh, Doug Smith will be giving a talk on lunar craters, which will be uh, interesting for anybody who likes to do lunar, lunar observing. Um, also probably learn some cool things out of that as well. Hope it's interesting for other people too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Always something cool to learn there. Uh, so uh, without uh, any more delays, uh, Pete, we will toss it over to you. Okay, thank you. Can everybody see the first screen of the presentation? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. Very good. I'll have my cursor move around occasionally, but not a lot. Um, hey, uh, thank you for the opportunity to present uh, tonight's presentation on Ptolemy, probably one of the, well, not necessarily the first, but probably the first or second astronomer going back to ancient times of note. Uh, I think most people are familiar with Hipparchus. Hipparchus actually preceded Ptolemy. In fact, he used some of his information, some of his ideas that he carried on. But uh, essentially, Ptolemy is probably one of the most well-known going back. Uh, you mentioned that he is Greek. Yes, he has Greek roots in his name. More than likely, his ancestry was Greek. And in fact, when, uh, you know, when we talk about him today, let's see if I can get my screens to advance. Dun, dun, dun. Huh. There we go. Anyhow, uh, just really two aspects that we're going to talk about tonight, his life and his work. Typical of most individuals, even of, you know, that were known uh, through history, there's very little about his life. Uh, when we're going back almost two millennia, 2000 years ago, uh, when he uh, first started, essentially you'll see a number of dates, but for the most part, he was probably born somewhere around 100 uh, CE, common era or AD, however you wanna look at it, and probably lived anywhere from 68 to, some cases I've seen dates up to almost 80 years old, and I find that kind of hard to believe for someone in that time, but maybe he was one of the exceptions. Uh, any of the pictures you saw, like on the first uh, slide that I have and on the second one, um, you know, as far as actual renderings of uh, pictures of Ptolemy himself, there's, these probably are not necessarily accurate. I don't think there were necessarily any images uh, that were memorialized uh, on paper or some other uh, medium. Uh, these are more or less just personifications of probably what was drawn up in the Middle Ages, uh, the middle of the second millennium. But for the most part, uh, Alexandra, we're not, or Alexandra, Ptolemy, we're not sure where he was born. Uh, it's pretty assured through the history that he died in Alexandria. And you can see a, a small map there of uh, Rome and Egypt. Uh, there wasn't a whole lot to it. And it, like I say, during this time, Egypt was under Roman rule. Uh, we'll get into a couple of the uh, roots of his name. But of course, you can see Alexandria up there pretty much on the western end of the Nile Delta. And there's one other place I want you to keep in mind, which is real close to Alexandria. And this will come up uh, towards the end of my presentation is Canopus. Uh, basically in the same area, we're not too far from where he probably passed. But like I say, we'll, we'll you know, work on his life a little bit, but more so, of course, what he's more known by rather in particular is in his life are some of the works. Uh, uh, he had some pretty substantial works. There's uh, one that he's very well known for, uh, dealing in astronomy and a couple of others, both in cartography and astrology, believe it or not. Of course, back in those days, astronomers, astrology, there was a certain mix there, but he makes an important distinction. And I think this stands out a little bit and much to his credit. Okay, basically it's like Claudius Ptolemaeus. Uh, you see he basically has a you know, Roman first name, a Greek last name. He's probably of Greek heritage. Uh, but for the most part, this is his Latin name. More than likely, 
Uh, he was probably a Roman citizen. Due to that being granted to one of his ancestors, either by one of the emperors, Claudius or Nero, uh, who preceded in the uh, previous century. Uh, here again, you see a number of dates, uh, basically the length of his life starting in 100 CE or AD up to 170. And the other sources will list derivations on that, going back even 15 years uh, prior to that and up to uh, you know, 168. Like I say in this one, you see that middle source 90 to 168, 78 years of age. That would be pretty good for an individual during that time period. Uh, for the most part, not quite sure where uh, you know, Ptolemy was born, but we're pretty sure that he died in Alexandria, which would be you know, Greek or Hellenized uh, Egypt under Roman rule at the time. I mean, there was a lot of Greek and Hellenic uh, influences in Egypt uh, preceding this time period uh, up through the Roman rule. Uh, pretty sure that he lived most of his life and like I say, more, more than likely died. Uh, major areas of study that uh, Ptolemy undertook, uh, you know, he was a mathematician, an astronomer, an astrologer, a geographer and a music theorist. I'm not gonna get too much in the music theorist uh, aspect, but basically uh, I'll just mention the fact that one of the things of course he tried to do with harmonics, uh, tried to marry up a little bit with some of his mathematics even though most of his uh, work in mathematics not, wasn't really necessarily pure mathematics, but more or less along the lines of uh, trig trigonometry uh, with respect to some of the models he had in astronomy. Uh, for the most part, you know, he wrote in ancient Greek. A lot of the ancient Greek manuscripts didn't survive. Uh, some of his works subsequently were translated into Arabic and in some cases Latin. Uh, some of those did survive, but generally they were uh, compilations that were done many hundreds of years after his life. And so it's somewhat difficult uh, trying to source some of these original documents because a lot of them just didn't survive. Uh, but for the most part, like I say, wrote in Greek, but, and he used a lot of data from other individuals, uh, principally with respect to astro uh, astronomical data. It was from the Babylonians and uh, you know the Islamic areas off to the east of Egypt. That's where a lot of that came from. And subsequently, a lot of that information uh, that he compiled, of course, you know, survived and was used by Western Europe up until the point of uh, the Middle Ages when, you know, the models of the sky, the heavens uh, changed somewhat substantially. But basically, this is all that's known about him. Was he married? Don't know. Did he have family, kids? You know, how large was his family that he, he came from? We really have no idea. Uh, we have a couple of ideas of uh, individuals that he might have been associated with with respect to you know, learning uh, uh, in some of the disciplines that he concentrated in. For instance, there's this Theon of Smyrna, uh, who was likely one of his teachers. Not exactly the most scholarly individual, but for the most part, being that Ptolemy was in and around Alexandria, of course, he had access to you know, probably one of the most extensive libraries in the known world at that time. And then the other individual, Cyrus, wasn't necessarily a teacher, could have been, but uh, most of the sources suspect that he was more, he might have been one of uh, Ptolemy's uh, contemporaries, uh, but nonetheless, they don't identify necessarily any projects or any work that they would have done together. But these were two individuals uh, that were identified as having somewhat of an influence in his life. And by all means, if anybody has any other additional information, questions, please speak up. The preponderance of uh, Ptolemy's uh, work and effort, of course, was done in astronomy. Uh, and uh, that was probably, I won't really want to assign a percentage to it, but if I was to make an estimation, at least a half, if not more. I uh, spent quite a, little, quite a bit of time in astronomical observations for about, oh, I think I have a time period there of about 15 years. Uh, a lot of his work was based on what Hipparchus had done preceding him. Marcus, you know, one of the first to combine math for predicting astronomical events with qualitative geometric models. One of the, you know, basically Ptolemy, you know, followed through and continued a lot of this work, but very heavily involved in his, you know, in the models, the geometric models, especially the nested spheres, and you know, of course, trying to, you know, present them on, you know, a single plane. Uh, that that was a lot of his work. You can see one thing that we do know based on the records 
that he compiled with respect to his observations. And we know he was at least alive and working during this period. Now, granted, the calendar change, has changed subsequently, but for the most part, his first uh, documented observation uh, was made on March 12th, the year 127. And his last one, at least of note, documented was on February 2 of 141, so 14, uh, not quite 14 years later. I mean, undoubtedly, there was a lot of work on either side of that. He probably lived for another 20 to 30 years after his last observations. I doubt those were his last, but these are the ones uh, that records survived uh, with respect to that were, uh, you know, uh, picked up in the Middle Ages and passed down into uh, later works, of course, then, you know, when printing came around. And this is one of the things, one of the, uh, one of the things we have to deal with, you know, given that, uh, you know, there isn't a whole lot with respect to, you know, you had manuscripts, but you, you know, you had basic original manuscripts, some were copied, uh, but there wasn't a whole lot of them. Uh, you know, it wasn't like in the middle ages when the printing press you know, eventually came around and there was wholesale movement of written material. Yeah, there was written material back in, you know, ancient times, but it was somewhat limited. And of course, in some cases, a lot of things uh, didn't survive. I saw the comment uh, with respect to the destruction of the uh, library at Alexandria. And I'm sure that, you know, a lot of things, not, I don't know if any of his work was necessarily lost, but I'm sure that there were a lot of things that were lost. And one, of course, one of the things that he is probably most well known for uh, with respect to astronomy is his geocentric models. Uh, Ptolemy's, you know, work and basis, and this came from, you know, prior, uh, I think Aristotle, uh, I don't necessarily know if he first came up with the idea, uh, but this was derived from Aristotle. Aristotle had the belief, and I shouldn't say belief, as far as his knowledge at that time, he understood that the earth was at the center of the universe. So did Ptolemy, and he constructed a lot of his models, a lot of his math working towards uh, trying to verify uh, the modeling that he'd done with respect to earth being at the center of the universe, uh, probably followed by the moon, and I think maybe Mercury and Venus and then the sun and then Mars. And beyond that, you know, there were, of course, there were the stars and that was the outer sphere. But with respect to the planets, I think Mars was about it. You'll see this uh, when we get to one of his other works as far as the breakdown of the various books. Uh, one of the other things that uh, Ptolemy was, uh, you know, spent a lot of time where we're constructing these tables uh, that were used, that could be used based on previous observations and his own uh, to identify the position, you know, for the sun, the moon, and the planets that were known at the time in the rising and setting of stars and eclipses, the very basic, you know, astronomical information. And he was able to establish these tables that showed when they occurred in the past and when they were likely to occur in the future. Uh, nothing was perfect here. These were estimations, but for the most part, uh, the math was fairly sound, at least for this time. Uh, major contributions throughout his lifetime, even outside of astronomy, of course, the Almagest was his uh, most ma was his major work. Uh, Mathematics and Taxes, the great treatise, uh, had 13 books in there, and I'll show you the breakdown. Uh, but that is probably the uh, one uh, work that he is uh, most is most well known for. Uh, not necessarily a lot of people were familiar with this. Uh, you know, for about the first 1500 years, this is a document that basically was the foundation for astronomy from his time up until the Middle Ages. And not necessarily a lot of people understood it because they didn't have the mathematics or understood the mathematical background and basis that he had put forward in this. Uh, he also did some work in geography, uh, basically uh, some cartography work with respect to the known world, which was pretty much uh, you know, Northern Africa, and you'll see a representation of the map, but basically the Roman Empire at that time, uh, and then out east through, you know, the central parts of Asia. Uh, a lot of his information was developed by Byzantine and Islamic uh, scholars and astronomers prior to him. And of course, the uh, work product uh, that he put out was a basis for a lot of Western European science with respect, especially to astronomy and some of the other areas uh, that he worked in subsequently. Going back to the Almagest, uh, this was, you know, a sole comprehensive work of astronomy from ancient times, one of the most copied, and it pretty much held uh, as the, you know, the uh, 
principal work all the way up until the Middle Ages, for all, basically for 1500 years, uh, which is pretty amazing uh, that uh, this one document, uh, this one piece of work uh, was able to basically pretty much form the basis of you know, any astronomical work that, you know, going back to the early part, uh, going back to ancient times all the way up to the Middle Ages. Uh, st had contained a star catalog. Portions, of course, were originally created by Hipparchus. This was follow-on work. It was very typical. Um, you know, you even see this going back a couple of hundred years, but it was very typical for scholars, writers, uh, anybody that was doing work. They would base it on someone else's. Uh, attribution wasn't as important back then as it is today. In fact, in some cases, uh, using someone else's work was considered uh, somewhat of an honor. Of course, nowadays, uh, you know, when uh, people put up their own pieces, they want to make sure and attribute any prior sources. But needless to say, you know, there's a lot of information and data out there, and certainly Ptolemy made use of it, especially past data, to uh, build his tables up for the predictive, uh, you know, positions of the uh, heavenly bodies later on. Uh, it's, Pretty much theorized that the Almagest was com was completed about 150 uh, CE, so somewhere between 15 and 20 years uh, before uh, Ptolemy died. Uh, one of the things that it contained were the 48 constellations that form the basis for the current 88. Here again, a lot of that I think was developed by Hipparchus, and uh, it was carried on. That work was carried on with Ptolemy. Uh, the big thing that Ptolemy did with respect to the Almagest, as far as astronomical information and data, was, you know, this this publication contained a lot of tables that incorporated uh, being able to identify the positions of the planets in the past or in the future, and some of those other events uh, that I mentioned previously. The Almagest, and here for just just for uh, if anybody's Greek and they can read that. Uh, the first thing you see in the parentheses is the Greek title, and then the Al Majisti it would be the Arabic, the phonetic sounding uh, Arabic version. Of course, it's not an Arabic uh, lettering, but typically these were the languages of the day. And like I say, I think uh, most of Ptolemy's works were originally, as far as his work, were originally published or put down in Greek. But anyhow, you know, here you see the 13 books that were contained within the languages. You know, the first uh, book. Uh, Cosmology and trigonometry lays down, you know, the mathematical and trigonometric basis uh, for some of the things that he presented in his treatise. Uh, then moving on to spherical astronomy, and then he covers the main heavenly bodies that were known at the time: the sun, the moon, eclipses naturally to talk about fixed stars, Mercury, Venus, and Mars, Jupiter and Saturn. I don't know if he necessarily, uh, you know, did that work specifically with respect to those bodies, or he had something else out there. Uh, that was seen. I'm not too sure that this was very specific, but it is, you know, it is one of the books that's mentioned in there. Uh, I'm not too sure that he might have necessarily identified them. They were big enough to be seen, uh, surely, but uh, as far as their basic motions uh, and whatnot. And then, of course, he gets into retro retrogradation, which uh, explained uh, some of the anomalous movements, especially the outer planets, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn, uh, as the Earth went around its rotation, which was <clears throat> One of the more basic things that was difficult to explain uh, with his geocentric modeling of the universe, let alone the solar system, and then planetary latitudes, talking about uh, different locations on the Earth and uh, you know how things would show up differently uh, depending on where you were at. Other works in astronomy, uh, the Analema, which was a short work on sun location correlated with uh, declination of the sun, terrestrial latitude and hour, basically the figure, you know, the figure eight uh, that the sun will scribe in the sky at the same time uh, during the day as it moves uh, uh, during, through the course of the year. Doug, did you want to add anything about this? Anything you know about Ptolemy with respect to the Analema? No, <laughs> I know he did it. I, I know that. And, and he, he was just following the work of the ancient Greeks long before him, yeah. Aristotle and Eratosthenes. Right. Um, and then we have the uh, basis, uh, rising to the fixed stars. Uh, as with all the other bodies, you know, this specifically addressed the stars. Uh, you know, here again, going back to ancient times, they didn't have telescopes. Everything basically was naked eye observation. And of course, it was what he basically could observe 
from Alexandria through the course of a year. So I mean, you'd see quite a bit, but of course there was a good portion of the sky that was never available to him. Uh, the planispherium, simplification of the sphere. This is where you know a lot of his work was based on, you know, the spherical representation of uh, of the uh, of the sky, and being able to lay that down into a plane, lay that down into a, a piece of paper, and model it uh, accordingly. Uh, I mentioned uh, before, you know, keep in mind, uh, Canopus. Uh, this was actually a, a location, a town, a city. I call it a town. I suspect it was just west of Alexandria, but it was on the far uh, western end of, uh, of the uh, Nile uh, River Delta, uh, just as it emptied out of the Mediterranean. And this is an inscription that uh, Ptolemy was responsible for at some temple. I'm not sure which one. I'm going to assume it was probably a Roman temple, uh, but basically an inscription that he left. And here again, it's not necessarily at the end of his life, but probably at the peak. Uh, of, of the work he was doing at the time in astronomy. And I'll just leave the quotation. This is the quotation on the inscription. Uh, of course, this inscription never survived in this temple. Whether or not this temple was destroyed due to military action, flooding, earthquake, uh, but it was no longer there. Uh, this was something that was supposedly transcribed uh, from the original source back in, I think, uh, about the sixth century and held over and was documented uh, from that time. Later contributions, and this is probably uh, one of uh, Ptolemy's latest works in astronomy, the planetary hypotheses, and actually it was more, you know, number of ideas. Uh, and of course, this is the one that cements his idea of the geocentric model of the heavens on the end of the solar system, however you want to look at it. Uh, of course, like I say, it was based on these spheres moving outward uh, from the Earth. Uh, you know, all the stars were basically on a sphere. And of course, the individual, you know, the sun and the moon and the individual planets were on their own sphere, uh, moving out from the Earth, nested spheres. And you can see a representation of it in this uh, picture uh, to the lower right, uh, basically laying it out in planar form. And then there were a couple of, I, was, I thought there were a couple of interesting data points that Ptolemy had in this piece. Uh, but basically, you know, his estimation from the Earth to the uh, sun was approximately 1,210 Earth radii. Well, he was off by about a factor of 20. Uh, so, uh, you know, you'd underestimate it. I guess that means he was looking at about 180,000 miles. No, that's not right. It would be 40, 450,000 miles. So, and then here again, you look at his radius of the star sphere. He estimated that to be 20,000 Earth radii, which in actuality is just under an astronomical unit and very much off even to the closest star, uh, almost you know four light years in distance. And then the, uh, one of the final things he had in there, and I don't know, I, I don't know if he actually came up specifically with instructions, but he sort of described in some detail uh, about how to construct an orrery, which is basically I don't know if you've seen them before, but these are you know models, uh, you know the current uh, you know model with respect to uh, Basically, it could be mechanical. It was generally made of metal, but it would lay out the sun at you know the correct one, the sun at the center, and all the planets on little on little arms, and you could move them around and actually set them, and then set it in motion like a clock, and it would actually simulate the motion of the planets around the sun, not necessarily the distances, because we know that the distances can be quite big, you know, quite big, even if we have the Earth at the size of a pea. But nonetheless, he you know described. Uh, some basic ideas, some basic uh, points behind construction of such a device uh, to model uh, in three dimensions uh, the uh, heavens as he saw it at that time. A couple of other areas he worked in. Cartography was probably the second most. Uh, uh, you'll see, basically you can see a map over there to the right, which was pretty much Ptolemy's world map uh, that he dealt with. Uh, basically going from the equator up to uh, just north, uh, up, up towards the Shetland Islands in the uh, in the uh, United Kingdom, uh, not very much out into the Atlantic, uh, probably pretty much just to the uh, west coast of Europe and Africa. And then, of course, it was you know known that uh, you know China did exist. However, there weren't wasn't a whole lot of good detail about it. Just some of the uh, uh, about, you know the bodies of water immediately to the east of Egypt and uh, Arabia. But anyhow. Uh, like I say, his second most well-known work, uh, basically he 
further developed. He wasn't the first one to necessarily do it, uh, but, uh, oh, okay. Got it, Doug. I was just looking at your comment, Doug, about uh, is uh, measuring the radius. Interesting, okay. But anyhow, going back to his cartography, um, how to draw maps using geographic coordinates. He wasn't necessarily the first, but he continued some of that work. Uh, the most interesting thing about this you know, specific work was he identified 8,000 different localities. Now that doesn't necessarily mean towns or cities. It could be, you know, could be, I don't know, an oasis, but you know, 8,000 different localities. A good portion of those 6,300 that actually had assigned coordinates, latitude, longitude. And like I say, for, for the most part, uh, things were based on uh, latitude was measured from the equator. Uh, I, after the life of me, I can't remember where they measured their longitude from at that time. But, uh, you know, they used a common reference point. And so they're able to lay down these points uh, on a sphere and identify them. And of course, here again, using the work of previous, uh, previous scholars, uh, other folks that had already worked in these areas, you know, data, they used a lot of data from previous geographers like Marinus of Tyre. Uh, this would have gone, would have preceded him uh, by probably at least a century. And indices applicable to Roman and ancient Persian empire, which is just basically information about localities, about places uh, uh, throughout the known world at that time. Okay, astrology, and this wasn't something that he was into heavily, but uh, his most well-known work with respect to astrology was called the uh, Tetra Biblios, which is you know, very easily translated uh, to four books. Yeah, it's possible his uh, longitude might've been measured from Alexandria, Rome, but for some reason- the I, Capitals I were called at that time. Yeah, I know, and, and that's a, that makes a lot of sense, but I keep thinking, back to some point, and it wasn't necessarily from the prime meridian, but there was some point out west from one of the sources, and I just can't recall it. But I mean, that's, you know, be, being Alexandria or Rome, very likely. I mean, the prime- uh, Going back to the Tetra, uh, go ahead, Doug. The meridian wasn't established until a thousand years later. Okay. But going on with the astrology, the Tetra Biblios, uh, come here again. There was a lot of previous work that had been done in astrology, and basically Ptolemy took a lot of that work and compiled it in a single source. Uh, one of the big differences with respect to Ptolemy's work is, you know, he tried to personalize, you know, the ordering of that information and tried to rationalize astrology. Uh, the way he viewed astrology, not so much like people do today, I mean, he certainly saw in that I carry this, it wasn't necessarily a quote, but it was a quote from a source, but the physical, physical effects of heavens on terrestrial life. Certainly we know that the sun and the moon have direct physical effects, and they were certainly aware of that during this time. Uh, and certainly those two bodies had very significant effects you know, on terrestrial life, uh, not so much the other planets or the stars other than how they were perceived. But one of the things, like I say, Ptolemy, you know, he tried to rationalize astrology a little bit more. You know, he didn't look at it necessarily as a predictive, as a means of predicting human behavior or events, uh, which, you know, people put a lot of stock into uh, with respect to astrology and have for long periods of time. But rather, he, wanted, he was trying to look at the actual physical effects that the heavenly bodies had on life on the planet, you know, the direct uh, scientific or objective uh, uh, cause and effect. And that's basically it. These are the sources that I had. Uh, didn't get into a whole lot, but uh, the sources that I used. And like I say, I certainly thank you for your attention. Any questions or comments, please? That's the most information I've ever seen of Ptolemy in one place. Oh, really? Well, like I say, you know, there's not a whole lot about the individual himself. And it's more so about his works. I mean, there's a yeah. lot more data on the works, but that really gets down into the weeds. I think it covers... Uh, you know, the main thing, like I say, it was prime, you know, his primary works were astronomy and cartography. Those were his main areas, more so astronomy. But, you know, certainly, you know, he was, you know, the, not necessarily the developer, but very much. And like I say, this held for 1500 years, you yeah. know, the geocentric uh, idea of uh, the, the heavens. So, Pete, do you remember that presentation I did last month on that um, mural, The Man in the Universe? Yes, 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 I do. 
Do you remember at one point I talked about the destruction of the Library of Alexandria? Yes. And then yes. there was an Arabic figure in there. And I said that represented how the Arabic world continued to advance the science, even though the Library of Alexandria had been destroyed. Well, Ptolemy is a perfect example of that. As far as what the informa his information to be, well, I mean, he continued to advance science and stuff while the rest of Europe was in the dark ages and the library right. had been destroyed and he carried on. When was the library destroyed again? Um, I don't know the exact date, but it was destroyed about 10 years before Julius Caesar was assassinated. Trying to remember, Caesar it would have been during it was during the reign of Julius Caesar. Julius Caesar invaded. Egypt and uh, invaded the city of Alexandria and the Egyptian troops uh, laid siege to the city. And during that siege, the library got burned to the ground. It was a rebuilt to some degree? Yeah, some of the works survived. Uh, I mean, there were firefighting efforts, of course, to try to preserve it, but you know, back in those days, very primitive firefighting. Based on what uh, you told me though, I think that, that the initial destruction preceded Ptolemy, probably by, like by close to a century. 50 years. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. It'd be around 45 BCE. Okay. Thanks. So, yeah. Somewhere around there. So, at least almost 100 years prior to the peak of almost the at that years. time. Yeah. But so he's, he's, the, he's the epitome of the Arabs carrying on with the knowledge, even though the rest of Europe was in the Dark Ages by that time. Well, I think that's one of the reasons why you see a lot of star names. You look in atlases and whatnot, carry Arabic, yeah. Arabic derived names. Absolutely. I mean, very, it's, yeah. that's very common. You know, if I, you know, as I've gone through my programs, you see that all the time. Absolutely. That's exactly why they're like that. I have a question. Yes, go ahead. Um, you, know, you know, when you talk about these these fellows back in ancient times who do um, work in astronomy and and especially considering that they were basing it on a geocentric model, how do they go about predicting eclipses? What what I mean they they, they have mathematical well, ideas. But... Okay, Kay. So think about this. Um, if you do the analema, for example, uh -huh. okay, you can get all of the elements of the orbit of the Earth around the sun. You can get the eccentricity of the orbit, the, the tilt of the orbit, the, the tilt of the Earth. Uh, the, all of that information comes out of the analema. But, 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 Tom, but wait, but wait. The only difference is between now and then is when they did it then, the information they got, they thought, was the information about the sun's orbit around the earth. Mm -hmm. The orbit is the same. It's just a change in reference, okay? The orbit is exactly the same if you think about it. And if, 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 you, if you're on the earth and the sun is orbiting, all the elements are exactly the same. Semi-major axis, the eccentricity, all of it, the period, all of it's the same. So you can use that same orbital information and you get the same orbital information for the moon you can predict eclipses. Except there's, you know, Kay, there, you raise a good point because there is one, one area of this that does cause problems. And I'm, I'm sure they identified then because for the most part, the geocentric, and even if there had been a heliocentric, a lot of these astronomers back then, I think Ptolemy did the same thing, based everything on circular orbits, which we know now with respect to the moon, it's very circular. But you can, but when you start looking they, at the they, sun, um, yeah, you look at the Pop sun Earth relationship. Figured out the epicycle thing, you know, to yeah. make the orbit. Very right. The epicycles is what he used to modify that. Right. You know, with respect to the Earth and Moon, yeah, it's fairly circular. It's and complex. like Doug said, your reference it point, works. whether you're on the Moon or the Earth, it looks like one's going around the other. And with respect to mathematical data, would hold. The epi epicycles were used to explain the anomalous planetary behavior right. one for the outer planets and the retrograde motion and then also the fact that these were not circular orbits with respect to outside the earth moon system even if you know the earth had been the center you know and that would have been the, the case. cycle stuff 
if it's done correctly, actually works pretty good at predicting emotions. You know, they weren't perfect. You know, they realized they weren't perfect. I mean, it was acceptable. They were still off a little bit, yeah. but they had the general idea. And I think it's a matter of, you know, how precise did they want to be? And I think that they were somewhere aware that they weren't that precise, but they, they didn't necessarily fudge the data, but they did a little bit, but they found a way to make it work. The math and still works. fit. What's that? The math works. Yeah, the math works. And, you know, it fit close enough. It wasn't perfect, but it was close enough at the time. And of course, later on, as you get to the Middle Ages, you know, some of these individuals realized that, well, the Earth wasn't the center of the universe. And they started to identify the weaknesses in some of this work that had been done. You know, basically, you know, remember, Ptolemy's work held for 1,500 years. Yeah. And part of the problem was a lot of people, a lot of the people during that period really didn't, you know, there, was, there weren't a lot of mathematicians running around. There were very few people. Uh, and whether or not, you know, it could have been contradicted, uh, I suspect that it probably was, but in this case, a lot of those works never survived. You well, know, you got into the, the Dark the, Ages, uh, and you got into the bit where the, the geocentric model was blessed by the, by the church, and if you dared say that that wasn't true, you got staked to a post and burned. It was considered heresy to say that the geocentric model was not right. Did that somewhat answer your question, Kay? <laughs> it's a little bit of a convoluted. In answer. other words, they figured out the math and it worked. <laughs> they made the well, yeah. they made the math work basically. Yeah. Remember, the math here was basically trigonometry. Uh, yeah. You know, and that was that, that was the most, of, and you know, they realized that things didn't quite work out, and that's why, you know, one of the things that uh, Ptolemy discussed were these epi epicycles to explain the anomalous motion. Uh, the, especially the planets that didn't fit the model real well because of the uh, non-circular uh, nature of the orbits and the fact that on the outer planets, Mars and Jupiter, you know, you get into retrograde motion because they're outside the Earth's orbit and they're going to look like they're going backwards for a while. So, Well, thank you, everybody. Turn it back over to you, Connor. Good presentation, Pete. Mm -hmm. Thank you, sir. Okay. And uh, we're actually just going to transition straight over to Doug uh, in that case. All right. That groan almost sounded like you just didn't want to talk for another five minutes there, Doug. No, no, no. I just have to. I'm poking fun at you. Share screen thing. Uh, OK. I hope this works. I've also, oh, I got that too. Good. I'll have to switch at some point. That's not in presentation mode yet. Okay. Oh, something else on my screen. Let me get rid of something here. Why does it do this every day? Okay. Does everybody see that? Yes, sir. Okay. Yes. Okay. So we're going to talk about lunar craters. Um, I always have my comedy. Here's Haley looking for his comment. <laughs> All right, so anyone who's ever looked at the moon, even with a pair of binoculars, has obviously seen that it's covered with craters. Um, I'm going to go through and look at some of the more interesting craters that uh, are really good targets to look at uh, if you haven't looked at them before. Uh, I'm also going to give a little bit of a a brief rundown of how craters are formed and what sort of features you could look for when you look at craters, types of things that you might see. 
So, um, so here's a pretty good diagram of what happens when something like a meteor strikes the surface of any planet, but this is, we're talking about the moon. So initially you get your projectile, your meteor, it starts to penetrate the surface of your planet or moon. And uh, as soon as it starts to penetrate, it starts creating shock waves in the material around where it first struck. Um, as it penetrates deeper into the crust, um, all that kinetic energy, and there's a lot of kinetic energy, these things could be traveling 100,000 miles an hour relative to the body they strike. All that kinetic energy literally usually vaporizes the impactor projectile uh, and vaporizes a lot of the material immediately in front of it, uh, uh, around it as it penetrates through. The shock wave begins to go out and down through the surface and through the crust. And that shock wave spreads the material out and throws the material back up. Um, if, you, if you take a hammer and pound a hammer into a sandbox, uh, you'll see the sand come flying out in all directions. And that's because of the shock wave that is happening there. It's going out through the material. Um, as the shock wave continues to go deeper and deeper into the material, you get a rebound of the shock wave too. Um, think about hitting, hitting a bar of metal, for example, with a hammer. It bounces back. You get a rebound. Um, and if uh, the this bounce back will actually uplift the floor of the crater. Um, and if it's a big enough impact event, the shock wave will actually tend to concentrate towards the center of the crater. And that's what forms your central peak is it uplifts material right into the center and you form a central peak. And then the, the material that was thrown out forms an ejecta blanket that's, that it's called that falls back down in a radial pattern around your crater. Now, if it's a big crater, you can have a situation where the walls of the crater are very steep. Um, look at the little picture up there in the right that crater has very steep walls. And all of this material around the crater has been severely shocked, fractured, broken up, and is not very solid, for lack of a better way of saying it. And oftentimes in large craters, if it's a large enough impact, the crater walls will collapse. You'll get these landslides where the material will slide right down and you'll form a landslide on the bottom of the crater. Um, let's see if I can get in this area, you can see the landslide material that flowed out and you'll get these terraces all along the rim of the crater where this part of the rim has slid down here. It has to be a pretty good sized crater. You won't see this in a small crater. For example, Meteor Crater up by Flagstaff does not have this effect. The, the walls did not collapse. It's not big enough. But in craters on the moon, where you're often looking at craters that are 50 miles, 100 miles across in diameter, you'll see this a lot, almost all the time. Only in small craters will you not see collapsed crater rims and landslides on the floor. Okay, so the first crater we're going to look at is Copernicus. This is one of the most prominent craters on the moon. And it's the, it's 
often referred to as the model crater. It's got all of the classic features of a large impact crater. And um, if you look at it, it's got central peak that's broken up. But it's got a central peak here. It's got the terraced walls where the collapsed walls happened. Lots of collapsed walls. Here's the material, the landslide material that flowed out across the floor of the crater. Here's the ejecta blanket around the outside, the material that fell back down. Okay. And Copernicus is a very young crater. It's, it has a very uh, large ray system that's very obvious during full moon. Uh, you can see it down here in this image, the rays go out in all directions. Um, typically, uh, the rays disappear after about uh, anywhere from uh, around a billion years, the rays are gone. If the crater is older than a billion years, you probably don't see rays. And that's from micrometeorite erosion. The surface of the moon is constantly being bombarded by micrometeorites. And eventually the rays, which are very young, very bright material, they will get wiped out by micrometeorites so you won't see them anymore. And that will also wear, the micrometeorites will also wear down all the features of the crater. So over time, the crater won't look nice and pretty like Copernicus it has very fresh features, very sharp features. Everything looks, this is a young crater, so. And, and this is a good target for amateur astronomers to look at because you get a really good view of it. You're almost looking straight down. It's, it's near the center of the moon um, and you've got a really good view of it. It's not an oblique view. It's, it's not near the rim. It's, it's a really good view of it. Then of course there's Tycho. Um, Tycho is probably the most prominent crater on the moon, uh, certainly the brightest, one of the brightest. And um, you got a, a little bit of an oblique view of Tycho. If you look down here, you can see it's kind of oblong shape because it's, it's closer to the rim, so you're not looking at it straight down anymore. But it has all the same classic features, just like Copernicus. It has the slumped crater walls and the landslides on the floor of the crater, and a thick, heavy ejecta blanket all around the outside here. And it's got a really good central peak, a nice sharp central peak in the middle. And it, it, it has the most extensive ray system on the moon. It's very easy to see during a full moon, obviously. And it's a very young crater, probably only 100 million years. Copernicus is 800 million years. So Tycho is very young. And we go to the opposite extreme. Now we're looking at Clavius. And Clavius is pretty close to Tycho. Um, Tycho is right there. Copernicus is here. And Clavius is just beneath Tycho, right here. Uh, Clavius is an interesting crater. It's very old. It's one of the oldest craters you can look at. It's 4 billion years old. Um, and it's also one of the largest craters on the moon that does not form into a mirror. Let's see. Um, the larger impact basins, basins like uh, Mare Orientis or Mare Imbrium, for example, were formed by impacts, but they were formed by impacts that were larger than Clavius. Clavius was not quite large enough to form an impact basin, but it's close. If it was much larger, it would have formed an impact basin and it would be totally flooded with um, lava and it would be dark like the other seas on the surface of the moon. It didn't quite make it that big. Um, but if you take a look at, at Clavius, um, you can tell it's a very old crater. First of all, it doesn't have any rays. Um, secondly, it's, it's worn down. There's not much left of it uh, compared to Tycho and Kepler. You can see that the walls are 
pretty worn down. Uh, you don't see much left of landslides on the, on the floor. It's got a flat floor with almost no landslides. Um, you can't see, you can see a couple of places where the walls have collapsed, but most of that's almost gone. And the floor of the crater is heavily pockmarked with other craters. So there's been a lot of meteors hitting it since it was formed. Um, it is a really good target for amateur astronomers. They love to sketch it because of all the interesting features on the floor and around it. It makes for good sketches and good images. Uh, if, in fact, if you go to the Astronomical League website, the first thing you see when you look at the Astronomical League website is a, an award-winning sketch of Clavius. This is one of my favorite targets, um, Plato. Uh, this is one of the easiest things to find on the surface of the moon. Very recognizable target. Um, it's sketched a lot, imaged a lot. I've imaged it personally, I've sketched it. Um, and the main reason amateur astronomers love to sketch it and take pictures of it is the shadows. It casts these wonderful shadows as the sun changes the angle, these shadows change. And, and makes for really interesting sketching and imaging. Um, uh, it's quite challenging though. Um, it's an old crater also, it's 3.8 billion years. It has no rays and it's still, you can see a little bit of the ejecta blanket around the outside here and around out here. Some of the ejecta blanket is still there, but it's big enough to where it should have a central peak and should have landslides and stuff in the bottom. It's, I mean, it's larger than Tycho and it's larger than Copernicus, so it should have all those features. And at one time it did, but when, um, when, when all of the seas, when all of the major seas flooded with lava, this crater flooded with lava too and got filled up with lava so you can't see anything the central peak and all of the features that were there when the crater was first formed have been buried by a smooth coat of lava. And so it has a very smooth floor. So, uh, another thing that Plato has looked at a lot for is because astronomers, amateur astronomers have seen what they call transient phenomena in and around Plato. And I'll get to that. That's actually something that amateur astronomers look for when they look at the moon. Plato is a place where that happens relatively frequently compared to other places. Here's my image of Plato that I took with a camera on my uh, eight inch mead. Um, and again, you can see there's the nice shadows that the mountains tend to form all these cute little shadows. Uh, but in this image, there's some other interesting things that are challenging for amateur astronomers. There's another, this is called a, um, a walled off crater or a ring crater, if you like. Here's another one right here, just below it, just below Plato. Here's what's left of another one that was almost completely covered over by lava when this sea here formed. This, this crater here, which looks just a little bit bigger than Plato, but roughly the same size, was completely flooded out. There's nothing left, just a bare minimal outline of the rim. And then over here, and it, it, there's some ridges, you see some ridges here that are sticking up. But also in this image, which is a challenge to look for, you see some domes. These are domes. Um, these are features that are like volcanic dome type features. Um, and you can tell that by looking at the way the shadow and the light is. The craters 
have the shadow on the left and the light on the right because the, the sun is off to the left in this image. But these dome features are reversed. The, the light is on the left and the shadows on the right. So they're rises, they're little domes that are sticking up, little hills. So those are a challenging feature because you can tell they're really small. And this is my absolute favorite target, personal favorite, Theophilus and Cyrillus. These are a pair of craters. They're, they're over here in this part of the moon over here. Um, the interesting thing about these two craters, um, besides the fact that they, it's a nice, this Theophilus is this one here. Um, Theophilus is a really nice, good looking crater, well formed, has all the classic features, central peak, collapsed walls, the landslides on the floor are easily seen. It's got ejected blanket all around it out here. Um, in fact, the ejected blanket has practically filled up this crater here, Cyrillus. And you can see this crater is a much older crater. Everything, it just looks worn down. Uh, look at the central peak. It's not sharp anymore. It's very rounded type feature. And it's worn down from the constant micrometeorite bombardment. You can't see much left of the terraced walls. Just a little bit of a hint where there's terracing in the walls. There's still some over here. Um, but so that's a much older crater. And it's got blasted when Theophilus hit it. But they make for a nice pair for imaging and sketching. And Theophilus is around 2 billion years, and Cyrillus is closer to 3.5 billion years old. So a big difference in age. Um, Ptolemaeus, I hope I'm pronouncing that right. This is another crater that's very similar to Plato. It's a walled plain that was filled with lava. Um, but what makes this really interesting, amateurs love to go after this one when the light angle is very low, when the sun is very low in the sky from this crater, is because here you can see where there were a lot of impact craters that hit in here before the crater got flooded with lava. You can still see just a little bit of a hint of some of these craters. They're called ghost craters. Here's one right here. Okay, and then here's another one over here. And here's another one over here. These little ghost craters where the lava covered everything over and it's flowed over these craters. There was a little rise that still remained showing you where these ghost craters were. And so this makes for an interesting target to photograph or sketch at low sun angles to see if you can pick up these ghost craters. The angle has to be really low in order for you to catch these shadows on the rims. So, neat target. Our Zucco. Um, this is a favorite target for amateurs. Again, it has all the classic features, as you can see. It's got the terraced walls, the central peak. It's got the landslide debris all over the floor. It's got an ejected blanket and so on. But here, the uplift was so severe when the rebound caused the uplift of the floor, the floor of this crater is actually a bit of a dome. That it actually changes in elevation from here to here. It actually is in a dome shape. And as a result, it's cracked. You've got all kinds of these rills, these valleys, cracks, and there's more of them. There's cracks all over the floor of this crater. And people like amateurs like to photograph it and sketch it again when the sun angle is very low because then you can see those rills. That's the challenge is to pick out all these different rills uh, in the floor. So, and it's, it's located right in that area, right almost in the middle. 
of the moon. Yeah. Now this one is an interesting little crater. This is a little small crater called Hortensius. Um, it's not very big. Um, and then you notice this crater is small enough to where it doesn't have all the features that the large creatures have. It doesn't have a central peak. Uh, there's no collapsing of the walls or anything like that. The crater itself is not particularly special. Um, the crater is located right here. It's about halfway between Copernicus and Kepler. Here's Copernicus is there, Kepler is over here. It's located roughly halfway between. The crater itself is not particularly interesting. What's interesting about looking at this area, though, is nearby there are a number of shield volcanoes. Um, you can see in this picture, here's two of them right here. But here's the same area looking at the shield volcanoes. Here's the crater, Hortensis, right here. But there's these shield volcanoes that obviously formed much later than the crater and much later than this sea that the crater is sitting in. I forget the name of that sea um, that it's sitting in. Um, but these are fairly new features. And again, you can only see those, these under the right lighting conditions because they're not very tall. Um, they're pretty good size. They're like shield volcanoes like that in Hawaii. They're very wide. They're 10, 15, <coughs> 20 kilometers across, but they typically, in altitude, they might only be 500 meters high. So they're very, they're very shallow slopes. But it, it, this is, a, this is a, an area that's known for having a lot of these shield volcanoes. There's like eight or nine of them nearby this crater of Otensis. Um, and then, of course, there's Kepler, which is this bright crater over here. Kepler has a really bright ray system. It's a very young crater. Um, I couldn't get an exact quote for how young, uh, but it's probably actually younger than Tycho, uh, so probably less than 100 million years. And um, it has huge, compared to the diameter of the crater, huge collapse of the walls. They just, this whole side of the crater collapsed. Uh, it's got a central peak. And I think if the lighting came from the other direction, you'd see that this side also is heavily collapsed and terraced. Uh, um, again, it's a good target to look at. Um, Aristarchus. This is the brightest albedo feature on the surface of the moon. Uh, even when the moon is just lit by Earthlight, like in this picture here, it's real easy to see. <laughs> there it is, right there. This is the brightest feature, which means it's probably one of the youngest features. Okay, because um, even Tycho and Copernicus and and other craters like that, they're very young. But even so, the interior of the crater, if you go back and look at this guy, for example, the floor of the crater is not that bright anymore. It's been, it's been darkened by the micrometeorites striking and have darkened it down a bit to where it's not as bright as that. This thing is really bright compared to the rest of the surrounding area. And the micrometeorite bombardment has not eroded it away. Very sharp features, very young crater. It's, like I said, it's the brightest single albedo feature right there on the surface. Easily visible even on an Earthlit moon like that. Um, the other thing that's interesting about that makes this a popular target is there's a really neat valley nearby, here's, here's the crater, Aristarchus. There's this neat reel right here called Schroeder's Valley, uh, which is a favorite target for imagers and sketchers, um, right next to it. Um, 
this was this was an amateur image here, as a matter of fact, this one right here. Um, people love to take pictures of Schroeder's Valley. That's always a challenge to see. You have to get the right lighting conditions, low sun angle and stuff. Um, and here's a little crater called Marius, which is up here near the, near the rim. Um, the crater itself is not a particularly interesting crater. It's a wall plain like Plato, again, where it was flooded with lava. But these, all these little hillocks around here are shield volcanoes. This was a volcanic region right around here. Um, lots of them, you can see at least 20 or 30 of them in this picture. Um, and so those are an interesting feature to go look at. Uh, there's also lots of lava tubes in this area. You, you can see some of them, there's rills, there's uh, a rill in this case, is probably a collapsed lava tube. Um, there's lava tubes all over the place. And this area is where they found some of what they call windows, where the lava tube, part of the ceiling, not the whole ceiling, but part of the ceiling collapsed leaving um, what amounts to a sinkhole. That's exactly what it is. That's about, you can't see them in this picture and they're too small to see with your telescope, but they were discovered in this region. <coughs> These areas where uh, a 50 meter or 100 meter diameter sinkhole was formed, where the ceiling of a lava tube collapsed down into the lava tube and you've got this deep, well-like hole that goes down perhaps 500 meters or, or you know some distance down into the lava tube. And these are areas that they said could be places where you would build a lunar habitation because here you've got a ready-made well down into a lava tube underground where you could build a habitation area and you'd be protected from the radiation by the roof of the lava tube. Um, and so they found uh, several of them in this area because there's so many lava tubes. So this was a volcanic region. This is an interesting area to go look at. Um, and this is another one of my personal favorites, um, Cassendi. Uh, it's down here in this area. Um, it's just a really cool looking crater to me. Um, it's got some interesting features. It's got your central peak and it's got, it's got, you can see some of the terracing of the walls and some of the landslides. But here it was flooded with lava partially. The whole crater was not completely filled, but you can see where some of the lava that, I'm losing my mouth, some of the lava from this sea down here broke through the wall and started flooding the crater. And, and so it, it's an interesting crater. Um, and uh, here's somebody's sketch, not mine. <laughs> somebody's sketch of it. So yeah, they could, it's a good sketching crater. Um, one of the things that I always thought uh, makes for good sketching craters is you see these features like this escarpment here, this cliff here. And you got this crater up here, which is kind of cool. And it, it makes for the sketch looking more dramatic if you see things like that. So that's kind hey, of- Doug, I have a question. Yeah, go ahead. Any idea, when you look inside that, inside Gassandi, especially out to the central uh, peaks there, you see those little striations, are they rills? Those are rills, yeah. Yeah. And here, here you get a, it, this is another situation where the crater floor is actually kind of a dome. It's, it, it actually changes in elevation. Oh, okay. It cracks gotcha. and you get the, the rills form from the rebound back up and can cause the floor to crack that way. And that's okay, what you're seeing you. here. Yeah, that, you see that in some of the craters, not all of them. Yeah. Now, 1953, November, 
An amateur astronomer was taking an image of the moon on film. Here it is here on the right. And he saw, and he got, he captured this in the picture. Turned out that was a meteor hitting the moon. That was the, the exact second that the meteor struck the moon, causing the fireball that you see where that, all the ejected data is being thrown up into the, into the space and you, you get this bright flash that only lasts a couple of seconds. And he was lucky enough to catch it on his picture. And um, that was the only known case of an observation of that for, I don't know, 20, 25 years. But then people started looking at the moon with digital cameras and, and started looking at the moon on a more constant, continuous basis. And we started to see more and more of that happen. Here's another one. And this happened during an eclipse. Look at that. During an eclipse, somebody got lucky. And then here's another one that happened uh, when during an earth -lit moon. Okay, you see these meteors striking the moon. And now it's been common practice. Now it's very, it, it happens all the time now. People are monitoring the moon during eclipses, during earth -lit phases, where most of the moon is being lit by earth -lit. Um, especially during known meteor showers. If you think about it, when the Earth goes through a stream of meteors or, or leftover debris from a comet and it goes through this stream of meteors every year, well, the Moon's going through that stream of meteors too. So it's bound to be hit by meteors just as the Earth is struck by meteors when we go through a meteor shower. So this oh, is something God. that happens all the time, yeah. Doug, so if I happen to be watching the moon some night and some meteor hit, and then I can get in and it's a sufficient enough hit that I can actually resolve an image, a crater, uh, will the IAU accept my name for it? <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know, because uh, these, like this I know, it's here. probably, it would be too small. It would have to be pretty well, substantial, probably. This one here, this image here, they found the crater. Okay. They went and they looked with the lunar orbiting satellites, and they found the crater, 1.5 kilometers in diameter. Uh, yeah, you wouldn't see that with a telescope. That's yeah. just, um, well, maybe you would. I'm not sure. It depends on the scope. But yeah. these are not going to be big craters. These are going to be smaller craters. Um, but if you were the only one who observed it and you had the observation, I don't know. They might let you name it. It probably have to be something substantial where you could be able to where you'd be able to see. They don't um, normally you, name craters that small. Yeah, I know. We get that. It, those, those are considered satellite craters. They're usually named after the largest crater that's close by, and then they give them a letter designation like right. Tycho A, Tycho B, Tycho C, stuff like that. If it yeah. was a large uh, asteroid that would cause a very large crater, I'm pretty sure we would hear about it well before it hits the moon with all the media going, we're all going to die. <laughs> oh, yeah, that would probably be a near-Earth asteroid identified before it got close to the moon. Yeah. yeah. Um, but this has been common practice now where the people are monitoring the moon during Earth light um, and during eclipses and, you know, any chance, and, and especially during... Um, meteor showers. In fact, I know I was reading that there's some observatory that uh, has a telescope that does nothing but monitor the moon during meteor showers. They just point it up there and they got a video camera and they're just rolling all the time. Yeah, so that's something that you can do out of the ordinary, a little bit different, and watch for meteors hitting the moon during a meteor shower. Um, now, let's see, I've got I to break away from this for a second. And I've got uh, something here. Can you see this? Can everybody see this? No, I'm still seeing your previous slide. And, uh... and you're not seeing, you're not seeing my... Uh, Oh, let me 
maybe I got to change the share screen to the other window. Let me try that. Yeah, you have to reshare, I think, to okay. show another object. Let me reshare. How do I reshare? Okay, let me you, stop. You have yeah. to stop the Zoom share and then restart share. again. Yep. And share again. Okay. Yes, sir. There was something I want to show you. This. Are okay. oh, you got that? Just about. Uh, there got you a go. Bunch, yep. A uh, bunch of pictures. Okay. Yep. I got a really cool video here that I found. So here's a video showing a meteor impact on the moon. Look this, there. This is from. I don't know where it's from. I couldn't find the source, but someone it's 9 p.m. something looks yeah. like 1981 from the middle yeah. number. So somebody's got a video camera looking at the at the terminator of the moon and they caught a meteor impact and you can see the cloud of gas going coming out right there. See that? Oh, OK. Where your cursor is. Where the yep. cursor is. Yeah. Oh, wow, that's not, okay. Yeah. Bang. See that? They caught it. So that's kind of cool. Okay. Uh, let's go back to the other one. Oh, he's got it on a five <laughs> second. That was a five second loop. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Where's my, where's my, uh oh. I lost my other one. Here. I have a question for you. Yeah. Um, can you could you see something like that on a full moon? Do you think? No, you probably wouldn't see it on a full moon. You 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 pretty much. I mean, if you if you look at all these pictures, you pretty much have to be in a in a part of the moon that's dark. Yeah. Well, Otherwise, you're just not going to notice it. Right. Okay. Yeah. I suppose if it was big enough and bright enough, you'd notice it. Um, I mean, there there is an example. Uh, back in the, about 500 years ago, a bunch of monks in Germany recorded or, or described what turned out to be an asteroid collision with the moon. They saw a huge pillar of fire come out from the rim of the moon, and then they saw a dark, the moon turned very dark. The moon vibrated and shook in their in their description, they said it vibrated and shook. And then they said a large dark mass covered the face of the moon. And, and where the pillar of fire was coming out, they saw sparks and, well, you know how monks are describing things. It turns out there is a crater called Bruno, which is right on the rim of the moon, um, right where they described the collision as occurring. It's a big crater. It's like 60 kilometers across. And you can actually see it during libration, once or twice a month when the libration is at the right point. It's actually visible. And the, the professional astronomers who study the moon um, looked at that crater with lunar orbital and all the other satellites that, that they have. And they came to the conclusion that, yes, it's a very young crater, perhaps as young as 500 years. And also, the seismometers on the moon that were left by the Apollo astronauts still measure vibrations. And the moon is still shaking from that collision. And they measured the, the vibrations in the moon using the seismometers. And there's a right amplitude and the right everything for a collision to have occurred about 500 years ago. So some monks in Germany probably witnessed an asteroid collision. That's and kind in of a case like that. Obviously, you'd see it. Something that large, you'd see. <laughs> that, that's kind of crazy that it had imparted enough energy to the moon to to leave a detectable energy wave after 500 years. I know. It's not much, obviously. It's probably it, very, yeah, it'd be very but small, but that's still a lot of energy. Yeah, well, I don't think about it. It had to be a pretty huge rock to leave a 50 kilometer crater. Uh, 
50 kilometers. That'd probably be about a three kilometer asteroid, just judging, yeah. just recalling from basic, uh, some yeah. basic asteroid measurements of impact craters on Earth that I know about. That's be at least size be at least rock. <laughs> three, three kilometers could be a good estimate for that. Yeah. And it would it would create a large, I mean, the ejecta, the dust and the ejecta that would be thrown up by an asteroid collision that size would cover the moon. It would darken the moon for a period of time. You, you know, looking at it from the Earth, you'd see it covered up by this cloud of debris that would I eventually wonder, settle down. But I wonder if any of the debris from that rock re-entered Earth's atmosphere. That's very possible. You gotta, you gotta believe that some of the stuff that was thrown off was thrown off with escape velocity. No way, our luck it probably all went in the Pacific Ocean if it did. Good luck finding it. <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> Five hundred years ago, you don't know. So, but that, that I, I read that note. That was a bunch of monks in Germany saw that. So. Um, and then the other thing that people look at, I mentioned this before. It's what's called transient lunar phenomena. And this is where you look at something at a crater or you're looking at a rill or a valley and something looks different than what you remember. The lighting is different or something like this. And here's some actual photographic images of what you're talking about. Here's a crater photographed at one point in time. And here it is again, photographed at another point in time. Same camera, same telescope, everything else. There is a difference here. Notice that right there. And then here, same crater. And later, you they get this in the picture. Okay. And it turns out in this crater, there is a rill right here, cutting right through this area in the floor. Now, what they think this is, for the most case, is outgassing. There's still pockets of gas in the moon, okay, on the rocks, under the rocks. Uh, there's still radioactive materials in the moon that are probably producing radar, for example. And you've got other gases and things in the moon still left there in pockets. And once in a while, you get this outgassing from these places. Oftentimes, they, the outgassing comes out of the valleys, the rills, places where the surface is very fractured. Um, I showed you a couple of craters, Aristarchus, where there's a fractured, where they have fractured floors, or some of the other craters that have fractured floors, um, where you see these kinds of outgassing events. And um, professional astronomers have been seeing this for hundreds of years. I mean, this is not just something recent. Uh, some of the greatest professional astronomers have seen this and they noted it. And, it's been captured on, like I said, here's some photographs and it's been sketched. And this is something you can look for. Certain craters are hot spots for this kind of outgassing. And uh, I got a question. They like to go back and look at them. Yeah, go what ahead. About, what about, uh, is it possible to uh, garner a spectroscopic image of this outgassing? I'm assuming yes. Um, I couldn't find one. Yeah, uh, I think I'm, that'd I'm be, assuming if you have that'd be the next step to solve the mystery. I, I mean, think. these events don't last long. Right. These, these outgassing events, maybe a how, few minutes. How big is that one you're probably looking at, Doug? Well, I mean, I mean this, this crater is not a very big crater because it's very fuzzy. Okay. Picture. So my guess is it's a very small crater blown up a lot. Okay. But this was something that's probably imaged by a telescope, not an orbiter, correct? Correct. Okay. It just, these are images through a telescope um, where some somebody got lucky and liked looking at the same crater over and over again and got lucky and caught a couple of images of something. Any idea how old the images are? I couldn't find out the information. Okay. Just um, curious. Thank you. But it, it's been, um, I saw a map of outgassing events that have been recorded and there are literally hundreds of them on the surface of the moon that have been recorded, scattered all over. Um, and like I said, there are certain craters that are hot spots, and I think I can. Uh, Cassendi is a place because of the fractured floor, uh, is a. Um, and uh, Aristarchus, 
they've seen them there, especially around where they see them on Aristarchus is a lot of times, let me get back there. Uh, the outcasting events seem to happen around down here, around what this little crater down here that forms the end of Schroeder's Valley. This is a known hotspot for outgassing events right in this area. And then I, as I told you, I think I mentioned Plato, which is weird because Plato, you wouldn't think would necessarily be a hot spot, uh, but it's known to be a spot where outgassing events have been seen. So, um, but so people, some amateur astronomers spend a lot of time looking at these areas to just see if they can catch an outgassing event. So, yeah. Um, and that's the end of my presentation, folks. Any other questions? Bravo, bravo, interesting. Thank you, Doug. Yes, uh, thank you. And before we go, if I can find the right button, there is one picture I do want to share. Uh, continuing on the theme for uh, do, 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 from the moon. So this is a picture that was posted online earlier this month. Cool. Yeah, I know I saw that, but I didn't yeah. know where I could fit that in. Yeah, <laughs> I, I still wanted to share it though because it's such it's just such a cool picture. Um, I think the colors represent different minerals or something. Yes. So yeah. the the red is representative of iron and right. feldspar. Uh, the blue areas that you see are representative of uh, oxidized titanium. Mm. Oh, wow. Mm. That uh, I didn't know. At least according to the description, which I am double checking to make sure I read that correctly. Yeah. So the reddish tones demonstrate areas rich in iron and feldspar, while the bluish areas are spots where the regulus is rich in titanium. And oxidation from influence from the Earth's atmosphere makes the colors appear slightly as they do. So this this is very much color enhanced. Um, but the, the uh, just because I, I do a lot of imaging when I when the sky isn't cloudy for three months on end, this is a one, <laughs> this is a one hundred and seventy four megapixel image. <laughs> Whoa! So to give you an idea of how much zoom is in this, I'm going to just click here and just. You get a little bit of distortion in this. You can kind of see it's a little bit distorted. I'm not sure if this is from the focus of the camera that they were using uh, or if it's atmospheric distortion from their seeing conditions, but yeah, it, 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 it is uh, quite, a, and I can't, I'm, I'm not in a good viewer to drag around and show off some of this. I'm just showing this off in Chrome. Oh, wow. Um, nice picture. Yeah. They, they uh, used, uh, the same technique that is commonly used for planetary imaging. So they actually just did a planetary image camera over the whole surface of the moon, came away with about 200,000 individual frames, and then spent a long time putting them all together. Wow, very good. 200,000. Um, if you would like. That is Copernicus. I'm going to throw, if anyone wants to go down and stare at this uh, on their own later, the link to the image itself is being thrown in the chat. So if you guys, you. If, if anyone wanted to download that and go stare at it and drag around and see what other interesting things they might just be able to find from this really cool image, uh, by all means, go to town. Thank you. That's really cool. Yeah, that was a very impressive image. And with that, uh, that's going to, I'm going to end the recording here.